Hello. We have Hi. arrived. And we're joined with award-winning comedian Chris Forbes. Yes. Chrissy boy, how are we? I'm very well, thanks. How's yourselves? Very well, indeed, as well, yeah. Very good. We're all good, we're yeah. all good. You're just a wee bit hungover as I'm well, you were li- saying. A little bit rough there, a bit hanging, but uh, this good. is the perfect anecdote. Mm-hmm. You look good, you look fresh, I must say. Aye, you it's the salt be. rock, that's what's doing it. It just changes it, the <laughs> minute you get around it. You were saying your missus is into that? She's right into salt rock, aye. She's, you know, we get into some kinky stuff. She looks <laughs> <laughs> it gets dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> something, something's supposed to happen, isn't it? I don't know the ins and outs, but they're supposed it's to be. something about uh, negative ions. That's it. And positive ions. It's like, so see when you go to like uh, <clears throat> the jungle or the seaside aye. and you get this natural oh, that's you know, right, good aye. buzz, that's me to do the same thing, you turn it on. Well, that's what's happening because about an hour ago I was clinging to the floor. And so this is, <laughs> in the presence of this salt rock, I'm, I'm, uh, All of a sudden. I'm changing career. I'm going to be a spiritualist and a revolutionist. Excellent. So we have been connected through mutual friend Darren Connell. Yep. Shouts to you, Darren boy. And you were on his podcast recently, weren't you? Aye, a wee while ago I did Darren's. So so was that a while ago? Because I think he's uploaded it recently. So I think ah. he's now moving stuff to YouTube, which is great. So maybe it was an older oh, one. Oh, right. Ah, yes. So whatever we said there, I stand by whatever I said. <laughs> <laughs> whenever we filmed it. Well, okay. aye, so I was about to say. No, Darren's a good guy. So I, I guess the first place to start for me would be, you're obviously most known for your role in Scott Squad. Scott Squad. Uh, which you're one of the polis. That's it. Charlie McIntosh. Big big C Mac. So good. Do you PC know, do you know McIntosh. Every series I'm like, it'd be great if we can, could get a nickname and catch on, like a C Mac, a big Charlie mm-hmm. Mac or something like that. Never. The lad normal. He's just not a cool guy. It'll never happen. <laughs> He's killing the show though. Uh, to you know, I don't know what reference a cool we're using here, but he is definitely he's a Aye. great, great guy. Aren't like it? the best Dungeons and Dragons player, cool. <laughs> that kind of cool, Aye. right? So how did how did that come about for you? How did that happen? Just um, obviously, Scott Squad was getting uh, developed. There was people that a few of the cast that are obviously still in the core cast were involved with making a taster tape. Then when it got commissioned, you know, I, I still had to audition for the role, so went in and auditioned. Um, the audition process for Scott Squad was great because it was already very improvised based and you were getting paired with different people and I think about in the second or third callback I was paired together with Ashley Smith who went on to become my partner in the show Brilliant. Um, but yeah it was very it, it was it, it was helped a lot by the fact that I worked in comedy and was working as a stand up and there was a huge comedy influence they were asking a lot of stand ups to be involved and the comedy unit that make the show I'd already worked with before as well so it was just a perfect combination of stuff, mm-hmm. really. Mm-hmm. And uh, being from a rural background myself, it was kind of almost typecast to a degree. They're like, mm-hmm. we'll put you in the country bumpkin role, which yeah. I was more than happy with. Mm-hmm. Uh, country? So where, where are you from originally then? Well, I, I mean, for the majority of my life, I grew up in Bridge of Weir, uh, a wee place just outside uh, Glasgow. But our family are from the northwest coast of Scotland. Uh, tiny wee places, uh, Pullew. My mum's from there. My grand's still there. I know it sounds like I'm making up a noise, but it's a real place. Pull you in Gearloch, just along from it on the coast, which is lovely. So, wow, nice. uh, lovely area up there. It's it's superb. Mm. It's, uh, there's actually nowhere else in the world that's as pretty. It's mm. it's beautiful. Sometimes blown away with just how amazing Scotland is up. Aye. In those areas, like Isla Harris as well. Like <laughs> the sands up there. Some oh, of the man. pictures you see. Aye. Roasting, roasting. <laughs> White sands now to use them. <laughs> well, that looks That's great. That's a good thing. It's untouched. <laughs> I'm not, no, no, I'm joking. though, no, it does. It's good. We were actually talking about that in the van. You know, like how most people are so negative when it comes to Scotland, Aye. and we're all actually quite like, "No, Scotland's mm. beautiful, man. Scotland's you know, a great place." Do you know that whole train spotting speech is so famous with it? Scotland's shite, and mm-hmm. it, you know, it, it's. It was it was such a brilliant speech, but it's kind of like people still use that, and it's it's horrible. It's like we're kind of a victim of our own success. See, a lot of TV and movies in Scotland concentrate on the just on the poverty and the, the mm-hmm. deg- degradation and stuff. But there's so much more to be positive about. So I don't like the train spotting mentality. Obviously, mm-hmm. that has to be highlighted, but. We really need to punch ourselves up a bit We need to get past more. that. Aye. Agree. Did you watch uh, Billy Conley's stuff? Brilliant. I thought that was a really nice mix and blend of a sort of positive and negative narrative of mm. Glasgow, especially. But I thought that really played out well, and it's the one the kind of thing you're like, you want more episodes. Aye. 
I honestly think our Scottish football national team would do better if we just weren't as negative. Mm-hmm. Like oh, definitely. We, like, if, if we had an, a, a cl- <laughs> Them in the changing rock. room. <laughs> Hunters in the you changing room. You know what I mean? But, like, that equivalent of that, but from everyone's just consciousness mm-hmm. pushing po- positive vibes yeah. towards mm-hmm. the team. Because we're, we're already defeated. We're already yeah. kind of going, Before ah. Before a boss even kicked. Aye, before I before say, a kick a ball. Before a boss a... kicked. But I mean, that probably starts with like a three 0 win over England. Then it does. Aye, aye, I'm, 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 you know, I'm. I'm believe. <laughs> I'm aiming yeah. high. <laughs> like, yes. Right. Okay. That's interesting, though, in terms of like the mentality here. So, how do you find it being as a comedian then? Because your first thing was stand up, wasn't it? Yeah. And aye. Darren, Darren spoke a wee bit about how the comedy game can be a little bit cutthroat as well. Oh, I. If aye. you're out there on your own, a lot of weird friends. I, um, music's the same as well you know there's people out to get you but there's also positive people so how do you navigate your way through I, I think it's great I think as you say all the arts really music and comedy and uh, anything acting it attracts people from every walk of life so I think it's a it's a beautiful community to be involved with because you get people coming from every class background from every skill set every level mm-hmm. um, but I comedy in particular I think does attract a particular type of maniac mm-hmm. uh, like I've yet to meet one comedian without a, a really horrific character flaw or some sort of tragic backstory you know it really mm-hmm. seems like a place that people go to kind of be able to vent talk about mm-hmm. stuff so it's really nice but yes as much as the community is wonderful obviously stand-up's a very isolating hobby and the mm-hmm. highs of it are incredible and uh, so if you have a terrible gig, it can feel awful. But even if you have the best gig of your life in front of how many of people, literally, you know, 10 minutes later, you're off stage, you're back into your car, or you're driving home and you're in your flat. And the change from such a high low to then nothing directly afterwards is hard. Yeah. So you really have to. And that would be the same with anyone, music people yeah, yeah. doing a big gig or whatever. But We've experienced that a lot with you. Lots of times. I, we discussed that quite a, quite a bit. It's exactly the same with all the arts or artists aye, aye. in general. It was, just, it was funny when you were saying that there. I remember Sanjeev Coley telling us right. about that. Aye. And they just finished the hydro, sold out. And like literally half an hour before he was driving home in his car, going in to get a pint of milk. <laughs> yeah. He was on the stage, screaming crowds. Yeah, yeah. He's just walking into his... There's billboards with his name on it and all that. He's just getting a pint of milk. Uh, just a half pint, please. <laughs> <laughs> no, and he's like, but the, the drastic change Aye. in that, you know, and it's the same with music. It's like hotel rooms, if you're on your own. Aye. I always you know. think it'd be funny for the audience to almost be able... It would ruin the magic of people then just walking out on stage, but... To see what you're actually up to, you know, people have these views of what's going on backstage mm. or in green rooms or on your way to the gig, like people are getting mental or doing drugs <laughs> and drink, we're going to do this yeah. show, but the reality is you've probably just had your dinner and a cup of tea and mm-hmm. said goodbye and pat the dog mm-hmm. and you're sitting backstage thinking, oh, I hope I don't die in my hole and I hope I'm a human being that's worth something and yeah, yeah. Then, you, <laughs> then you go out and they think that you're all together and you've yeah. done this slick show and then you just come back Made off it. going, oh, maybe I'm worth something for tonight and then I'll... <laughs> I'll try it again tomorrow, yeah, you know, yeah, it's yeah. it's horrible. It's it's not a healthy profession, but so you have to find balance, which is why we're promoting salt rocks here today. Yeah, yeah. Of course it is. I, I think that's so important though, because you, you do have so many people that like want to be famous or they want to, you know, be known for something, which is absolutely fine. Right. But the actual mental health stuff that Oof. comes with going and rocking a show and then sitting alone in a room Aye. if you don't have friends with you or whatever and yeah. you're travelling to your like the airport to here and we spoke a wee bit about that with Chris Kyle as well how how do you tend to deal I mean obviously you've been at it years now I've been watching you doing some stand-ups like 2007 which we'll get to so you've been doing it a while yes so how do you deal with that well I, I tell you and I, like I don't make any qualms about how schmaltzy or cheesy this is but Eleanor my fiance is like the biggest grounder for me regardless of what's going on and she she properly changed my mindset in fact the, the guys I was out with last night are also involved in comedy and uh uh, I was at, we, at one point we were actually talking about uh, meeting Eleanor. I'm getting married this year, and they were like, "It's, it's great, it's great you're getting married." Eleanor's a great girl, and I, I just had a wee moment. It was a few, a few, a few glasses in, but uh, and I said, "It is great." I says, "I think if I hadn't met Eleanor, I probably would have self-destructed by now." And they honestly both went like, "Yep, yep, I don't think, <laughs> I don't think you'd have made it." So she really changed mm-hmm. me thinking from just. I would probably just you, 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 I think when you start out you have a bit of a selfish mentality if you're in a particular profession where you think you have to succeed you think oh I need to succeed I need to do this I need to achieve something but then you meet someone and it grounds you and you, you realise there's so much more that's important yeah yeah. so Eleanor really is my 
I can't, I can't uh, prescribe her to everyone. Is it? I was going to say <laughs> no pressure, no pressure, Ellen. <laughs> uh, well, technically, I could prescribe her because she's a she's a psychologist, which explains a lot as well. So, uh, so if you're struggling, uh, give Ellen a call. You know, psychology pimp. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but that's, that's cool. That's a, a bang on thing. Having that support's huge, isn't it? Mega I, important. There's, Mega a, important. there's a brilliant. Uh, I'm just rambling. I'm sorry, but no, uh, please go. The, the Jerry Seinfeld uh, documentary com- uh, comedian. It's just called. He tells a brilliant story towards uh, the the Ornie Williams guy that's coming up about what it does take. There is certain people that are are really cutthroat, and if you are working in a selfish industry where you you'd step over everyone to get where you're going. Uh, and you, you kind of have to want that. You kind of, I think, you have to want to sacrifice a lot of normal lifestyle comforts if you want to reach a certain level. And he describes it in this brilliant anecdote where he talks about there's a. a this is paraphrasing, so if I'm getting this slightly wrong, but like a band is on its way to do a gig somewhere, and like the plane has to land somewhere that's t- far away from the place, and there's a snowstorm, and then they get a train, and the train breaks down, so like we'll have to walk the last ten miles, and they're just walking through fields and snowstorm and blizzards, but they want to do this gig, like they have to do this gig, it means something to them, and on their way they see this house just in the middle of nowhere, and there's like they, there's a light on in the window, and they they huddle up in the snowstorm outside, they've got their musical instruments and all that, they're looking in and there's a family there and there's the kids happy and the open fire logs burning dinner on the table it looks like just beautiful life but these people looking in the artists the one of them says to the other how do people live like that <laughs> you know and I, so i think you have to kind of have that mentality sometimes mm-hmm. but you kind of make a decision it's like what do you actually want out of what you're doing you know mm-hmm. is it all or nothing like i want to succeed and just have success or do you want a bit of a balance? Do you want to have, you know, good people around you, family, home? That's great point, man, great point. Because I think so many people, I like to make a kind of point, like if you're going to choose a certain lifestyle, you can't then moan when that lifestyle starts throwing the stuff that you knew you were going to get coming yeah. at you when it comes. Aye. Because you just need to be in the mindset of, look, sometimes you're going to be shoveling shit. Yeah, yeah. Other times you're, you're going to be a shoveling huge, caviar. <laughs> <laughs> a, a huge one is uh, the financial thing. Yeah. So like starting out comedy, starting out artist artistically in anything, right. like musician, DJ. <laughs> Where's the money? It's like, <laughs> but every every all your peers, no doubt, or your school friends and college, or your graduate mates, Huge. they're all away now salaried up. Yeah. You know, and, and if you're still there, beating away at the same thing that you were, you're always wanting to do, and maybe your breaks not quite came. That is probably one when of you the giving most it up, challenging man. Things, Aye. You know? Another another great comedian. Good point. A, well, brilliant comedian Glenn Wool told me a brilliant thing once, which was other people's success don't equate your failure. You know, so you have to kind of remember that uh, other people might be being successful or doing stuff, but it doesn't necessarily mean you won't get there or get to where you want to go. But just be patient. You're everyone's doing their own thing, and sometimes I look at friends before, certainly before I'd met Eleanor in particular, when I was just living a fairly, uh, you know, fairly unresponsible lifestyle and comedy and on the road and. Um, I would look at my mates that had just got kind of more regular jobs or, and they would have family and kids by then and all the rest of it, mortgage, and I'm going, oh, you know, I'm, I'm jealous because you, you seem to just be, you really have it together. But then they'd be looking at me saying, well, oh, we, we, we're jealous because you're doing this and that seems yeah. exciting. And, you know, the grass is always greener. So it's all perspective. It's like that story everyone, you told Everyone me. frames the success or perceived success totally different, don't they? They no. put it because they put it on to the next man or woman. So they go, right, oh, I've not done that by that age. Aye. Oh, I'm never going to do it. But what people really fail to realise that no matter where you're at in success, it's like everybody's journey is unique. Aye. Every single journey. There's no blueprint to go, do this, do that. This is what will happen. That's it. Everybody's is different. So it's like, it's how you frame it in your mind. Because right now mm. you could be successful. I mean, in my mind, I would say you're successful. Aye. And it, depending on what you think about yourself, ah, no, I've not done enough. I need to be doing bigger things. Even some of the biggest artists are still beating themselves up. Yeah, totally. They're right, like, right off the back of like, aye. you know, we're t- chatting to Chris Kyle there, you know, and one of the things he said about that was like right off the back, uh, back of that stunt. Jumping on the top of the hotel on the Burj in Dubai. Oh, out biggest, of a helicopter. Biggest man. stunt Red Bull have nearly done. And he's like, but immediately after, I was like, right, what am I doing now? Aye, what well, am I doing it. next? Boom, 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 yeah. boom, stacking it up. But I guess that's that kind of artist that he knows 
huge yeah. going to be massive going to be even bigger because of that mindset but it well. keeps you humbled as well doesn't it it keeps you a wee bit that you're not like everyone look at the the thing I, I did how cool is it how funny Aye. am I you're kind of you, like you I'm do, shite you do get those people as well you so. do and they're Aye. talking about something like 20 years ago or something like that you know I was massive back <laughs> this advert I'd done you know yeah. I still got the VHS you know? yeah 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 Aye. a bit Aye. Jack and Victor with their ice cream you know and that yeah. <laughs> it's like, you just need to move on and go to the next task and uh, keep totally. building and it's usually other people let you know when you've done a good job, innit? Aye. Oh, mate, you were a mate, and you're like, oh, somebody, somebody seen me? Oh, aye, I do things, don't I? I was oh, like, yeah. I was saying to you recently, I get like, because we are really trying to grow the podcast, this is one of our favourite parts, and somebody stopped me recently and was like, oh, you're the big man for the podcast. And that was the first time I'd ever been recognised from the podcast, so I was like, my God, that that is amazing. Aye. So it's like, it's about keeping that, isn't it? Whether it's 10 people that recognise you or a million aye. or one person, it's mm. like, it, you know, for me, I was just like, I can't believe you enjoyed it thank you so much you know what I mean aye it's good I think we're tackling big issues here today man straight off the bat it's great usually but that happens when I hang over and that don't you (laughs) you you get a wee bit deeper I did I was waking up I was singing Neil Diamond last night I was singing I Am I Said you know so I I, you know that's a dark place to go but (laughs) it's a beautiful song what time did you call it it was about three, I think. That's not too Aye. bad, not too. Because I seen your message coming about half one in the morning. Oh, right. yeah, you're yeah, just like, big man. Uh, what sort time? What out. train is it? <laughs> oh, no, nah, right, it's not the right time to be doing this. Yeah. But don't worry about it. We'll, we'll sort it in the morning. Right. So, what was right? Well, back to Scott Squad. Yes. Right. Obviously, amazing. Just won a BAFTA and stuff recently. That's right. There. Aye. Now, what was it like working with Dan Connell on set? Well, we we don't work together, you know, at all, just because of the different scenes. Aye, okay. it's we, we often talk about that, and people often ask, you know, what's it like working with Grado or Jack or whoever. But we literally see each other at the very start. There's usually a bit of a cast photo, and then we see each other at the end. There's a usually there's a rap party, a party. with the cast. But generally, everyone's out at different times. Sometimes we'll see each other in crossing if we're out. Maybe he's in the morning, I'm in the afternoon. But you're out with who you shoot with, you know. So Darren works with Karen, and yeah. they're they've they've got the same setup. So essentially, they just spend kind of three or four days. He just walks in and out and keeps coming up. Whereas me and Ashley are completely different unit base. Mm-hmm. We film all our stuff out in the country, so uh, you just don't see anyone. Mm-hmm. But being part of the same show as these people is a great thing. It's obviously awesome. So you look locate locations then, so you're based outside Glasgow somewhere, just rural I, roads. We so. actually, yeah, I, d- I don't think it's something that I'm not allowed to say, but we Strathblane is specifically where our unit base is, right. and then because it's kind of right in the middle of loads of fields and farms, um, and we, we, it's one of the things that we've been quite good. We always talk call ourselves like the underdogs of the show, like we kind of fly under the radar a bit more, um, but we we definitely get the best deal in terms of getting to film interesting places. Uh, going over to Millport or up the top of a mountain or cause, because we have to be seen mm-hmm. to be outside of the city mm-hmm. they really make an effort to do that so that's good fun yeah, that's good fun I, do you ever get mistaken for real please? I was going to say well, yeah. every single series it's every, all the real gear it's I, like full on and I, I, I'll tell, I, I actually tell you two, two funny stories well they might not be funny that's for other people to decide you know. <laughs> but uh, the first one is <laughs> So so many times if you're filming and they're doing the kind of long lens shots, you know, so it, you're just walking down somewhere. That's when people think you're police because they don't see the cameras or anything. And sometimes people will shout out abuse. Like it's happened a few times, just like, oh, you know, pigs or whatever. Like that. But then when someone goes up and says, oh, they're just acting, they go, all oh, right, oh, cool, you're all right. As if your, your whole, because of your profession, oh, you're it's judged. not actually a police. Aye, it's so ridiculous to think that that's pro- they just get that all the time. Aye. But the minute, like, oh, we're actually an actor, oh, you're all right then. <laughs> but a minute ago, I thought you were the worst person in the world. No, you're all right. And Can I get a picture? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And the, the other funniest time it ever happened was, I actually fell ill, uh, season three or something, but I had a kind of sudden illness on set and I had to be rushed to hospital. Um, but it, it, it was so quick, I was just taken in. It, was, it wasn't like the crew came with me or anything, so I was full uniform. Well, officer down! I and like, got met with a trolley. So when I get pushed in dressed as a police officer, man, I have never been seen so quick Honestly. in all my life, straight through, doctors in. And it wasn't for about, honestly, about an hour into it, uh, until someone actually went, oh, so what, what branch do you work out of? And I was like, oh, oh, oh God, sorry, no, I'm I'm just an actor. I was just filming something. And they were like, oh, you're spitting on me. You know, it was like <laughs> the opposite reaction. Yeah. But they really had gone above and beyond because they were like, we've got a fellow servicer here, man. Fellow servicemen, yeah, yeah. So it was quite an interesting experience. 
I'd seen a wee bit about that on the Darren Connell oh, podcast. Right, yeah, I, think, yeah. I think I'd seen a little bit about that, and that that's such a that's so uh, interesting because you you do. It's funny how like people like that will be shouting stuff like that to the police, uh, yet they'll be the first people they call when trouble goes down. Mm. You know, uh, so it's quite cool for you to see both sides of it uh, as a normal punter. It's good, actually. Bizarrely, the kind of group of mates that I went to school with that we're still pally with. So like three out of six of them became police officers so it's, it's been quite funny that I always tell them that I'm technically a police officer now as well but with a lot of good insight and uh, I've used a couple of their stories as well so uh, it's, it's, it's quite funny that's one thing we're fascinated about isn't mm. it? so what happened what, how did you get that injury then Oh, it's it's too weird a story to get into. Was it to jumping be into something or like some water? Darren has a theory about it. He had like right. his own theory about it's because you went in the water in your underwear for a scene, not like. Right. I'd had a so what was the scene then? Like what happened? <laughs> There was, there's, this is, this is not how the result, mate. come on, come on, this is not, this is not what, what, what happened, but he thinks it's because, I can't even remember which body of water it was, but I think it was season one or two where I had to wade in in my underwear to rescue a cat in a boat, Right. and Darren was like, it's probably because you were in the water and you got some mad infection and it just, you know, mm. rotted your insides or something, <laughs> but I mean, I don't mind sharing the fact that just all of a sudden I was, I was pissing blood. And I was in absolute agony, and I was like, "Oh, I'm I'm dying." It's it's a really it's it's a horrible thing to have to say to you know you've got fifty people hanging about your crew and cast, mm -hmm. and you know they're all oh, by the way working a clock. Something's wrong here. <laughs> and I'm, just I'm, going to, I'm going to the <laughs> toilet. It actually happened a few times, and I didn't want to say anything at first, and I was in excruciating pain. And then the kind of last time I went, we were actually filming in someone's house. They probably never knew about this, but it was one of the last times I went, and it was just pissing razor blades blood and I was bending over and I couldn't I just couldn't go back Oof. out and I had to say a wee ru one of the runners I was like I just feel like I have to say to someone that I'm kind of in a bad way here and I'm, I'm pissing blood and I, I might be dying and they were like oh we need to get you to the hospital and they, they just that was it man so I was laid out for for quite a while and had a couple of things going on for a wow. while. But, okay now though. But I coming back strong Darren came to visit me in the hospital that was pretty funny actually as well. No, I idea, <laughs> no idea what it was then just no I do it's just it, there's loads of weird stuff that went on there's a lot of, I can't even remember the names of the types of infections Aye, I got crazy. but there was an infection that in fact actually it was we'll get right into stuff like my <laughs> bladder my prostate my intestines <laughs> I was taking an antibiotic that they used to treat to treat radiation poisoning. It was so strong. Wow, oh, man! I, I lost loads of weight. I was I was ill for ages. So, walking Chernobyl. I uh, actually one of the doctors said, "I think you might have just got unlucky." I was like, "Well, I, I agree." <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ! Though how fragile life can be, oh, man. Aye, uh, so that was it. I remember I watched and it was a still game, one of the, the more recent ones, and this involved like Jack and Victor jumping into the canal right aye and I'm like man they surely would have swept that canal and that you know before they'd, they'd done it because it was like you know that kind of thing you jump into like a canal Mary Hill you're like maybe there's like you know something sharp or like aye, you know, pretty aye. bogging you know because <laughs> the two of them went right for it you know and I was like jeez <laughs> holy you know because um, they aren't that deep no, you know no, it's like aye. the trolleys and Oof. other sharp oh, objects man. Well, aye. But aye, that's a so, scary one, man. There you go. But I'm glad you're all right. That's it, me too. And just <laughs> full recovery, all good. Full recovery, all good. Well, so. Fantastic, mate. <laughs> God, man, that's scary, man, isn't well, it? It just shows you what can happen. Aye, aye, it was mad. Right, well, we're talking about rural scenes, right? We'll, we'll, come, we'll come away from your bladder now, right? <laughs> so, um, we, the farm. Yes. Right, so your new programme, The Farm, yep. the, now, you, I didn't know you were actually, you wrote it. you have been behind the whole programme. Yep. Now, I've watched only one episode, I think it was episode three. Okay. Amazing. Good. Loving it, so I'm oh, going to go back you. and watch the rest. Thanks very and much. And funnily, I pieced together that the guy from the Bomb Scene Squad and Scott Squad yes. is the same guy. So, how I, did that happen? So, Jim Smith, uh, and people would know him also from the, from the bomb scene in Scott Squad. He's, he's been in Scott Squad and other scenes, and then uh, people know him as well now from doing like farm diaries for, for short stuff. Um, but yes, he I co-write the show with him, but essentially what happened was pretty much after the first time I met him, where we filmed a wee scene for Scott Squad on a farm, um, uh, I started thinking a farm would be an incredible location for a, a new sitcom, which is, I've written loads of sitcoms 
hardly any of them have been made, but usually the first starting point for me is where's someone that hasn't been explored, where's someone that could have a whole world built around and can easy, containable set. And uh, the fact that Jim was an actual farmer, I don't know if a lot of people know that. I mean, he talks about it in his stand-up and stuff as well, but he's a genuine farmer. He runs a farm seven days a week. He's, he's mad, but he still gigs. He does all sorts. And uh, I said to him, would you be interested in helping me write a sitcom about a farm? Because I wouldn't know, you know, the technical details and stuff, you know, you know what would you call this part of a bailer or something like that? Mm-hmm. But he was right up for it, you know. He, he was right into writing. He'd done a lot of stuff with young farmers and stuff like this. So we set about doing it. We actually wrote... The first time we wrote a half hour pilot for it and uh, it was I would say I was saying four years ago and about a year after we'd done it we did a, a live read through of it at the Stand Comedy Club. We actually had uh, Mark Cox from Still Game and Anita Fatiz and a couple other brilliant actors doing a it was gonna be like a uh, a sitcom, it was gonna be a studio sitcom show. But um yeah, it went through a lot of different processes, a lot of different developments. T V takes a long time. And it just so happened, good timing-wise, that since then, uh, the new channel was starting to be announced. They were looking for regional content. Jim Smith himself's done more comedy. He's done more acting, so he's enough of a presence to be like, look, you should just be, you should be you. You should play Jim the farmer because you are one, <laughs> and he's brilliant at it. You know, uh, great, brings a lot of authenticity. So. Yeah, thankfully we got that commission for an iPlayer miniseries uh, and it uh, looks like we'll be doing another one, three new episodes and it looks like they'll be building that, you know, to become a new show for you know next oh, yeah, year or man, something. Oh, yeah, so I exciting process. So cool, is that like the, you know, you mentioned about writing then, so you've been writing for as long as you've been doing comedy then? Aye, I've, I've always written and again, I, I don't want to keep kind of going on about different weird uh, things in the creative industry, but uh, like, all comedians are writers. You know, comedians, I always think, get a, certain comedians, certainly better comedians and bigger comedians than me, they write all the time, but I don't think they get the credit they deserve. I think comedians still suffer from that kind of, it's just a gesture, a jester, you know, it's just a guy being funny. Someone pointed out to me once, and it's a brilliant observation, that on talk shows, they usually have, like, three guests and a, and a comedian or two guests and a comedian and the comedian's always the one at the end of the couch that they just go to for like a wee quip or something mm-hmm. but comedians you know write all their own stuff mm-hmm. so of course they're writers mm-hmm. and they have to produce their own stuff and yeah. put on shows mm-hmm. they direct their own shows they need to observe everything it's 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 a it's a hugely uh, kind of all-encompassing job so um all com- I just I just think comics are brilliant like mm-hmm. real pure purer stand-ups than me are just writing all the time mm-hmm. but I've always written Certainly at college as well, I did an acting course, but they really encouraged writing and script writing, so that was a huge thing. And then I did a creative writing course at Glasgow Uni because I wanted to become a better writer. And um, I wrote with two guys, James Curt and Kevin Maines. We had a sketch group called How Do I Get Up There? So we wrote all our own sketches, obviously, for that. And we had our own TV show in Scotland as well. It was just a pilot. but um, So I, I've always written, and I think that's probably the most I get joy out of doing something is if you've created your own content to do. Yeah, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, which is why everyone loves doing Scott Squad that's involved in Scott Squad, because it's improvised and you can you can be as creative have as you like. Just have total fun. Aye. I, I, I feel like I'm rambling a lot. I don't not know if, I don't know what you yeah, asked me there, but there you go. No, no, it made, made total <laughs> sense. Just asking about, like, you know, writing, obviously, mm. comedians writing all the time, and it's good that you've actually now got something like the farm that's yes, coming I, together. Yes, it know? does feel like, oh, finally, I've got, like, a baby, mm. like, like something that I can fully nurture, with Jim as well, who's, who's yeah, a brilliant, brilliant co-writer. See, it's interesting in terms of styles of comedy because obviously every comedian like a dj or whatever has got their own their own ways yep. so like bill burr for example i'm going to see him at the end of the month me too right cannot wait Aye. right cannot wait and i was watching i was watching him talking about advice on his podcast for comedians and stuff and one of the things he says is he actually he's like just because i'm lazy you know he's like he's like so lazy he's like but he says he doesn't really write Aye. what he actually does is he gets an idea down, but he says when he's on stage now, obviously because he's that comfortable and it's Bill Burr, yeah. he just tries out and then when something works, he'll take note of that. Yeah. But he's always just kind of trying it out and flexing the joke out yeah, as much yeah. as he can until it's like totally exhausted. Absolutely. Pretty interesting. And I, I still think that's it's 
I still think that's a form of writing. Yeah, writing. You, you know, he's, he's yeah, air writing, man. You know, yeah. he's, uh, he's verbally writing these mm -hmm. thoughts down, which is amazing. So what's your, what's your technique? What's your, how I, do you go about it? I've never, because I'm, I'm not a gaggy comedian. I don't have a lot of jokes. So I work in a similar way. Storytelling. Where I, if there's a story I want to tell, I'll, be, I'll, I'll make a note of it and then uh, kind of workshop it on stage until it's got the right beats. But mm -hmm. it is very helpful if you can kind of write stuff down and just kind of add little bits of flair and touches. So... Um, but yeah, I'm more of a, a workshop guy as well. But it's all, it's all useful, all helpful. I wish I was a better joke writer. I know sometimes gag smiths will be like, well, I wish I could tell stories, mm -hmm. but I, I wish I had a kind of better, I wish I had a better blend of the two. Yeah. I mean, you're doing all right. But you're doing all right, mate. Again, pros and cons are different styles, I aye, guess. Aye. Uh, you know, you can beat yourself up for not being a bit like that, yeah. but really you're brilliant at this. Yeah. Aye, it's, it seems you know, to be working. Aye, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Do you, so do you write in a particular place? Do you go out, or do you have a wee studio place that you like to sit at, and like for inspiration? Or certainly for the the script writing, I've been going to. Uh, I'll just give it a shout out. The Glad Cafe in the South Side. Oh, yeah, it's been, been a there. been a nice wee hub for me. Uh, I I always try to write in the house, but it's just distractions. And I also think that you have to. Uh, we were talking earlier as well about you. you, you, you People need to give themselves more respect and punch up creatively in Scotland. Mm -hmm. You know, I think people think uh, you, you just ha you, you can't talk about if you're doing well or if you're working on something or even call yourself an artist or a creative person. And so I think you have to treat it like a, a job. So I felt like you had to go out somewhere and uh, like even renting little office space where you can go and write, like getting up in the morning and going, if this is what I want to do for a living, I want to treat it like a job. So mm -hmm. get up mm -hmm. at nine, you know, have breakfast, go in, sit somewhere and actually work on what you want to do and not just be kind of like, ah, you know, maybe I'll do it. I might, I'm kind of working on this thing. Mm -hmm. So I've tried to go out now all, all the time because if I sit in the house, I get lazy, I'll play Red Dead Redemption, I'll, you know, I'll do anything, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just hang out with the salt lamp. But I, I need to get out, <laughs> I need to get out and write because I want to treat it like a job. I want to feel like it's a professional thing. Yeah, I've heard that from <clears throat> loads of artists. I mean, I've done it myself when we first came in here. I was in my bedroom. DJing and, and making music before anything really kind of kicked off and I thought because I was in the house all the time I was like starting to get that kind of lazy way I'll just get a coffee now Aye. that wee programs on and I'll get that then I'll Aye. get the studio to work mm -hmm. so we got here but I found now because we've been in here like creatively sometimes I'm like at night oh I wish I could just make music now in the house and I'm Aye. like but I don't want to go to the <laughs> yep. studios I've kind of almost came like 360 in a way where like <laughs> Kind of essentially that. I just like I set up in the house and I set up Aye. in the studio Do as both. well. So you've got Aye. whatever that strikes. Because for me, sometimes it'll be like, it could be a one in the morning. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Rather than like, you know, up in sticks and leave into the studio. So it's like, you know, it's a bit of both. You've got to get a balance, I Finding out that balance, just working your way through Aye. it. Again, yeah. I'd say, actually, Eleanor said something as well. Again, it's Eleanor's influence of kind of, when she met me telling me to like, you have to believe that you're doing okay. Like you, you are doing well. Mm -hmm. But it's always that thought of I don't know. And she's mm -hmm. like, it's a, it's a job. You're doing well. You know, believe in yourself and all this. But she also said a brilliant thing. She's actually said it backstage in a green room to other comedians before, and it freaked everybody out. But because she's a clinical psychologist, she finds comedians fascinating creatures. And we were all talking one day about how we were planning our fringe shows, and like no one had started. And that's a big, it's very common in the comedy world that comics are like, what are you doing for your fringe show? And it's like, oh, I haven't started writing mine yet. And you, you panic and panic. And then you leave it to the last minute, you know, and you're cramming your stress and you do the show and you're like, oh, you know. And Eleanor was just kind of taking all this in and she was like, there's a reason that, you know, people do that. And she was saying it's because if you actually poured your life and soul into something and worked hard on it and then it failed or didn't work out, you'd be like, I'm shy. <laughs> Why did I do that? I can't believe I worked on it so hard and it failed. But if you leave something to the last minute and then you can go, oh, well, I, you know, I I only, I, I'd only just wrote it. So it's mm -hmm. a continual safety net. Right. So you just wow. have to give yourself, you have to believe in yourself. You, but everyone was going, why did you just say that, man? Like, <laughs> that's what I've been doing psychologically without yeah. realising it. Like, just total putting it off and distracting wow. yourself from the reality of what you want to be doing. But you have to believe in yourself enough to go, I'm going to pour everything into this and work on it, you know. Wow. So true. Big question here. Xbox or PlayStation? PlayStation. Oh, get off. Get out. You know. I had an Xbox 360 for a while, if that brings back any, but I went PS4. The dark side. I actually just got a PlayStation 4 last Christmas, like a big kid, man. I was so excited. <laughs> yeah. I was so excited. I get back into the, the gaming world last Christmas there as well, because it's been years and years like, yeah. without it, because I was like, I can't play that anymore. Like, I went from like, 
GTA Vice City in San Andreas, hammering it <laughs> in a big massive gap where yeah. I like, got myself together and yeah. made something out of the music. Yeah. And then I, I went back to it and it was totally like being a kid again. Oh, man. I've actually got new games and a console. Ah, yeah, yeah. It it's like the best funny. thing, best gift ever. It was good. Do you know what I mean? Now we're loving it, back loving it. We were a <laughs> night. It's good to wind down, actually. It's good for switching off. It totally yeah, is. And you're just going into nonsense land. Aye, you which is I mean? actually really oh, good. Man. And actually, a lot of the time, if we if we're playing together, we'll come up with new stuff while we're on the headset. All like, the time, ah. try not to work right now, and then you, before you know it, we're actually back on. Like turn right. over that, turn over <laughs> that. Right, right, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> like, get that guy, get that guy. <laughs> <laughs> you find yourself yeah. in this weird terrain, right? So, what, I mean, I mean, how long have you actually been then full time doing this, and and how long did you know that you wanted to be a comedian, like? In terms of full time, I'm trying to think when the kind of jump would have been. Um, what were you doing before? I was doing all sorts straight out of college. I'd, I'd, I'd worked in uh, supermarkets, even just in my local supermarket for ages when I was at kind of college and uni. It was a what was it first? It was a spa, and then it was a Morrison's, a co-op, a Summerfield. I've got loads of fleeces, man. It's like having jerseys. <laughs> <laughs> you put both teams. Um, I've had Morrison's. I've ticked that. I've ticked that uh, Morrison's box. I've been there. Groceries. And, uh, but I after after college, uh, I I went to uni. But then I went back to college when I thought I, I want to do acting. I want to do performing. Had I just gone straight in a job after uni, I'd, I'd I'd done sports science and physiology because I was I was writing a basketball and I thought I should do something sporty. But I ended up kind of going a bit awry at uni. I ended up doing a getting a degree in geography. I can't remember exactly how that happened. <laughs> But sports science. Aye, it was it was a, it was it was a weird a weird time. I actually got a G for chemistry. I didn't know that existed, but uh, I don't know if I was the first person ever. But gangster, I got, I got like a, G. a G. That's pretty cool, right? Aye. But thankfully, when I got out of acting college, I I'd, I'd started stand up just open spots in my kind of second or third year when I was at college. But I got into TIE work, um, which was theatre and education. So going around schools, doing the, the kind of groups you hated when you were a wee kid that would come in and be like, don't do drugs, stay in oh. school. And all that. <laughs> but it was supposed to be like a kind of updated workshoppy one where we were talking to kids that were literally going to be leaving school and talking about apprenticeships. So it was, it was nicer, but it was very cheesy. It was like we had to do a rap at the start and there was no way you, there's no way you can make a rap cool when you're at school going in as a, a, a mad big lanky white guy like, <laughs> I thought that when I'd leave school that'd be me I'm done I'm gone I'm totally free <laughs> <laughs> it was it was awful you know so I, oh, I did that it like it roasted oh me. man I, so and it's it's quite a common job for that just to get when you come out of college uh, and I did I did that for like three years like doing different tours when tour contracts would come up I would do that and uh, I was building stand-up slowly. Um, thankfully, the sketch groups kind of snowballed so the success with that, and that helped with the, the stand-up. And then when Scott Squad came along, I think really after Scott Squad, so I was probably four or five years into stand-up before it was like, I feel like I'm doing enough mm -hmm. now professionally to be just doing comedy, uh, which was a big, big thing. Amazing feeling. So that, that uh, you made the call to, kind of, I guess, go pro. I like, just fully commit to this. I'm getting booked enough to not have to be doing anything else. Uh, but it does feel like a big jump, but it's, it's exciting. Yeah, it's a scary jump. Aye. So that was about four or five years ago, you said then? That, yeah, that aye. What's 2018? So I was maybe, probably about 2000 and uh, aye, kind of 10, 11, 12, 11, maybe. Mm -hmm. Amazing. So you do lots of stuff with the BBC, the short aye. stuff. Yes, aye. How's that been going? That the, Some of those sketches are brilliant. Uh, I've got a couple of, of favoured ones. I quite like the, the, the one about directions. Mm. If you so like it's like because that genuinely happens to me every single time like you're the directions guy mm. if we're out somewhere because if I ask someone directions the, by the second sentence I'm already thinking about like what I'm doing uh, that night or whatever and I'm like no I'm it's uh, they're great fun actually uh, short stuff's been brilliant for Scotland again in general just for, for anyone in creative and even for camera people editors and uh, and then just content makers but um, I think you were saying you had uh, Sanjeev on mm -hmm. as well we, we were actually asked to do one of the very first ones when short stuff was created for Burns Day the Rabbi Burns one yeah. and uh, at, at the very start they only were they were really only going to do them for certain dates and events it was like we're looking for a sketch for Burns Day or Wimbledon or Tea in the Park but it grew and grew and grew and there were, people could become more creative. And the big thing with them is that they still look for relatable content, which is the best and worst thing about online content is th there's loads of stuff you can do that's relatable, but loads of people are doing the same thing, which makes it, you, you know, it's kind of, you got to be careful what, what you're making. But um, 
it's grown and grown and grown so much and it gives loads of people a platform uh, to even just experience film and stuff, editing uh, a comedy platform for people that aren't necessarily in stand-up or haven't gotten, gotten too far in stand-up. So uh, short stuff's been great, great for me and mm-hmm. uh, the people I've worked with it as well. Uh, and I know they've got the, the kind of sister strand, the the social yes. as well, which is for even newer talent, mm-hmm. which is a great thing as well. I believe they're, they're a great team. Mm-hmm. That's huge. That's really blown up just now. That is great. I was saying to you uh, earlier on today, like TV and, and that kind of world is it's got so much more accessible and uh, closer than what it used to be. It's like, you know, even like us doing, I guess, essentially our own TV show. Yeah, really yeah. Here, cause this but it's like, you know, the likes of talking to yourself or uh, Sanjeev or who, anyone. It's almost like that gap between consumer and TVs is not anywhere near what it used to be, you know, which is great for Scotland, as mm-hmm. you said, you know, because it's so yeah, much more accessible. You can just, Aye. it's right there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'd agree with that. And we were saying earlier that the whole creative community is just much closer, mm-hmm. you know, for, across all the art forms. And the new channel is going to be huge for, for everyone, for, you know, crew members as well, and producers, mm-hmm. directors as Great. A lot of crossover work to be done. Now, I know we're quite pressed for time today, right? So I think a nice way to sort of round up would be what advice would you give to up-and-coming comedians or people that want to be on TV or getting noticed? How do you stand out when there's a storm of people trying to do the same sort of stuff? Aye, well, certainly, even just from what you said there, I think if you get into it thinking, I want to be in TV, that's that's maybe the... the the wrong way in terms of from acting or stand up I think for, for comedy you just you have to love comedy first and foremost and and then if you're good at it and work at it these things will come you know mm-hmm. people will notice what you're doing mm-hmm. so um, for, for stand up in particular if you want to get into stand up you just have to take it. I meet so many people that have said they want to try stand up and just they just didn't either know how to go to about it or they, they were too scared to do the first gig. But if you email somewhere like the Stand Comedy Club and get on the waiting list for their newcomers night, once that date is sent to you saying you're doing five minutes, you know, in this time, it, it really focuses you, man. You know, it will really drive you to do it. You've got to force yourself to do it. Mm-hmm. It's very addictive. And uh, acting, acting wise, Certainly doing any sort of acting course is invaluable. You know, it doesn't have to be, you know, you don't have to have gone to the conservatoire mm-hmm. or or anywhere really. Any sort of course will help you get some <clears throat> basic skills. And uh, for writing, the, the most invaluable tool, actually, if you're just even interested in wanting to find out tips and all that, the BBC Writers Room website is incredible. It's full of opportunities for new writers, experienced writers, competitions, monthly kind of challenges. It's, it's brilliant. Amazing. That is absolutely brilliant, you know, and you've, you've hit a lot of amazing things on the head when it, when it comes to that, and essentially it's just put the time in, isn't it? It is, aye. Like, whether you want to just, you know, when it comes to writing, it's like, read more, just get yourself, get that pen and yeah. paper out. Write every day. It's, it's actually my biggest pet peeve is when I meet other comics or actors or, or people that want to do stuff, and they go, they'll be like, oh, that's rubbish, or they'll slag something off, or they'll go, how, how, how's that getting made? Or, Why am I not getting mm-hmm. this or that? And it'll be like, well, what? What have you done? Like, what, what have you done to change that? it? Yeah. What have you have you written something? And it's like, well, no, but you, you can't ever expect something. You can't think that you deserve it. You, you just have to keep banging your head against the wall and writing because you love doing it. Mm-hmm. You just yeah. got to think, this is what I love doing, so I'll keep doing it until it, until it clicks. Yeah, but yeah, that's Great absolutely. Point. It. You know, it's like the passion has to be there in order for you to put the. The, the needed amount of work in yeah. and like the stress you'll go through the passion's oh, got to knock that stress away yeah because if you're not passionate enough then the stress will eat you up yep and yeah with it. the no money and the yeah. travelling <laughs> and all that sort <laughs> of like, stuff eating I, sandwiches every day yeah. and all that sort of I, stuff I remember seeing the, I, I remember <laughs> seeing David Tennant doing his uh, a wee speech it, it might have been at the conservatory it was a, they filmed the video and it was like they always get like a famous person to come in and give a speech at people's graduation and to the kind of new class of graduates from the acting course he said the fu- the very first thing he said was, "If you can do anything else, do that." You know, but if you can, like if you if you have to do <laughs> acting, like if you really what you you just feel like you have to mm-hmm. do it, then okay, pursue it. But if you can do anything else in your head, you think, "Well, I could be doing it." Do that mm-hmm. because otherwise it will eat you up. Mm-hmm. There'll be times where you're jealous, bitter, spiteful, hungry, your skin. It has to be the only thing mm-hmm. you want to do, man. That's that, cool. That's absolutely brilliant, you know. It is the cool. The way to look at that really just gets you aligned with 
the, the sheer mountain. Aye, aye the mindset as well. Yeah, yeah. I make that. It's a mindset mountain, really. Isn't mm-hmm, it? Totally. Like, even t- just now, you still beat yourself up. You know, mm-hmm. it's all like the time. Really, all the time. It just stops. <laughs> Anything else you want to plug? Because obviously the farm is on BBC iPlayer right now, episode three, so go and check that out. Is there anything else coming up that you want to plug or shows where people can come see you? Because we'll drop those links in and that, mate. You know, we want people to go and check you out. Lovely jubbly. I the farm's on the iPlayer. The first little mini series is on there for a year. And uh, Scott's Scott will be coming out in the spring, so watch out for that. My uh, Glasgow Comedy Festival show uh, is on March the 20th. Fourth, I believe. See how he remembered that. If that's the Sunday, and uh, it's very different from all my regular stand-up. It's it's a, it's one story, uh, uh, just one story about how I met a guy in Glasgow who who genuinely believed he was the son of God, and I met him and I interviewed him, and we've got clips of the interview, and I'll tell the story about how that came to pass. We'll need to come to that show. Sounds good. Aye. We'll need to come. That's your birthday, that. That is actually. Yeah. Well, that will. Twenty fourth of March. Yeah. Well, we've been enjoying the the real philosophical buzz. So if you if you're into that chat, you'll enjoy this show for yeah. sure. Oh, brilliant. We'll need to come and check Aye. it out, man. Sounds good. Well, thanks so much to Chris Forbes for joining us today. Do not forget to hit subscribe, guys, and please go and check out Chris Forbes' channel. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Quality. Cheers. Yeah.